conscious that we're in the presence of our Lord, expose the Blessed Sacrament. Let's say together first, O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. O Sacrament most holy, O Sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. And wherever our Lord is, there is Our Lady too. Ave Maria. Ave Maria. We focused today very much upon the sorrows of Our Lady as is appropriate during Lent, but in two days' time we come to one of the great feasts of the Church, one of the greatest feasts of the Church, exactly nine months before the celebration of Christmas and the Nativity. It's the feast, the solemnity of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so on this occasion, just two days before, let us prepare ourselves for that great mystery. I have a gift in advance for you, which is a picture of the Annunciation by Fra Angelico. It's from the 15th century, the middle part of that century, and it's a beautiful depiction of the mystery of the Annunciation. Um, I'm going to be referring to that in this sermon today. Because sometimes with images, we understand our faith better. We think through phantasms, the philosophers say, through images. That's why in our Catholic faith we have so many images. Why the medievals made beautiful stained glass so that we could interpret our faith. Because sometimes we see things with our eyes that we wouldn't otherwise understand with just the spoken word. And Fra Angelico, who was born at the end of the 14th century and lived a long way through the 15th century, the 1400s, knew this principle. He loved beauty because he loved Our Lady. And he's called Fra Angelico because, first of all, he was a friar. He joined the Dominican order. He ended up in Florence at the convent of San Marco, a beautiful place, and he's called Angelico, not because that was his name, but because he painted like an angel, Angelico being the word for angel. Fra Angelico, his real name is John of Fiesole, and he is one of the greatest painters of all time. And he was declared by Pope John Paul II as the patron of artists. He was beatified. And so he's very important for sacred art, for understanding our faith. He put the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas and the great theologians into his art to help us better understand it. Fra Angelico was known to pray very profoundly before he ever painted anything. And he believed that if we were not like Christ on the inside, we would not be able to produce Christ on the outside. He believed that you needed to pray in order to make good art. I sometimes wonder today, I don't know if you do, why so much of modern art is ugly and is sometimes coarse. It's because there's something not right with the soul. Fra Angelico transmitted what was in his soul. But the other reason is that he had the mysteries of faith in his intellect, which he could draw upon. Today we have all sorts of strange ideas in our minds, and so we, we don't produce the kind of art which he produced. So this picture, which is known as the Cortona Altarpiece, helps us to understand the mystery of the Annunciation and the mystery of the Incarnation. It's stands in the church uh, in Cortona as an altarpiece. Mass was said in front of it. And keep that in mind because it helps us to understand and decode what he's doing with this image. You see in the foreground of this picture by Fra Angelico that you can refer to, Our Lady and the angel Gabriel. And they are beautiful. Our Lady is, has a cloak of lapis lazuli, which was the symbol 
for royalty in, her ta in the medieval time when Frangelica was painting. It's that beautiful blue that was so hard to achieve in color. And she is also sat on a throne. Of course, this isn't as it would have looked if you had a, a cine camera at the time in Nazareth when the angel appeared. This is a theological image. He's helping us to, to see under the surface, to see what's there beneath the surface of things, to see the mystery behind the events that took place. Our Lady sits on a throne, is clothed in lapis lazuli because she is a queen. She would not have been recognized as a queen in her town of Nazareth, merely a wife of, eventually, of a carpenter, a lowly maiden at that time, prior to her marriage to Joseph. But she is a queen because she is the Immaculate One. She is the Immaculate Conception. The angel will actually refer to that. And you notice, out of the mouth of the angel, there are words. In those days, you couldn't have mu moving pictures, but Fra Angelico does pretty well to denote movement in this painting, which was remarkable for its age at the early part of the Renaissance. He's saying, hail, full of grace. Those words mean that she was filled with the life of God, that she, like no other, could be honored by an angelic being, a pure intelligence, a creature so majestic, who bends towards her, a mere mortal, it would seem, but the angel knows, as we know, that she is the Immaculate One. It's interesting that the angel speaks to her mind and to her heart, the message that she is to be the mother of the Son of God. I always marvel at the fact that a question is asked, that it's not declared by God. The Lord has supreme courtesy in asking a question of this virgin. It's, it's so remarkable. And the angel Gabriel has his finger. Maybe the finger's pointing to God, because up above, very cleverly in the architecture, God the Father is depicted. Or maybe he's saying, let us wait and be silent to wait for Mary's response. St. Bernard, a few centuries before Fra Angelico, meditated upon this mystery, and we must meditate upon the Annunciation. It is a mystery par excellence for spending time with. It's good to have an image to look at. And this is what St. Bernard said. And I wonder if Fra Angelico had this in mind when he painted this, certainly he would have known the passage. You have heard, O Virgin, that you will conceive and bear a son. You have heard that it will not be by man, but by the Holy Ghost. The angel awaits an answer. It is time for him to return to God who sent him. We too are waiting, O Lady, for your word of compassion. The sentence of condemnation weighs heavily upon us. The price of our salvation is offered to you. We shall be set free at once if you consent. If the eternal word of God, we all came to be, and behold, we die. In your brief response, we are to be remade in order to be recalled to life. Tearful Adam, with his sorrowing family, begs this of you in their exile from paradise. Abraham begs it. David begs it. All the holy patriarchs, your ancestors, ask it of you as they dwell in the country of the shadow of death. This is what the whole world waits for, prostrate at your feet. It is right in doing so, for on your word depends comfort for the wretched, ransom for the captive, freedom for the condemned, indeed salvation for all the sons of Adam, the whole of your race. Answer quickly, O Virgin, reply in haste to the angel, or rather, through the angel to the Lord. Answer with a word. Receive the word of God. Speak your own word. Conceive the divine word. Breathe a passing word. Embrace the eternal word. Why do you delay? Why are you afraid? Believe, give praise, and receive. Let humility be bold. Let modesty be confident. This is no time 
for virginal simplicity to forget prudence. In this matter alone, O prudent virgin, do not fear to be presumptuous. Though modest silence is pleasing, dutiful speech is now more necessary. Open your heart to faith, O blessed virgin, your lips to praise, your womb to the Creator. See, the desire of all the nations is at your door, knocking to enter. If he should pass by because of your delay, in sorrow you would begin to seek him afresh, the one whom you, your soul loves. Arise, hasten, open. Arise in faith, hasten in devotion, open in praise and thanksgiving. It's as if the whole universe, all of time, all of history, the whole cosmos, maybe that's why Fra Angelico has stars above Our Lady, the whole world and all the future awaits in this silence for the response of a free creature. And she says, and it comes forth from her mouth in this painting, Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, be it done unto me according to thy word. More important words have never been spoken on this earth. In the painting of Fra Angelico, if you look carefully, the words are upside down and back to front from our perspective and tilted upwards. It's so clever because the only person who can read these is God because he's up above looking down. The words are said to the Almighty. They're said to him. God the Father is depicted above and the Holy Spirit is descending upon Our Lady. It's a Trinitarian image. The Father, the Holy Spirit. Where is the Son? The Son is already now in the womb of the mother. The Redeemer is in the womb. Whenever you see in art the Virgin crossing her hands like this, it means that she has the Redeemer, the Word made flesh inside of her. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are there in this image. She has conceived him now in her womb, who she conceived in her heart before. Notice on her lap is the Word of God would have been the Old Testament, of course. What is she reading in that word? Many have speculated. Was she contemplating Isaiah, the prophet, who said, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is truly with us in this image. God come down. This is the pivotal moment of all time. Of course, we can say the passion and death and resurrection of our Lord is the culmination of his ministry on earth, and it saves us. But the power of salvation is already there in Mary through this Annunciation Incarnation, and it will explode forth. The cross and the resurrection simply remove the barriers of sin and the defeat the devil and give a new life of the body in the risen Christ but it's already there in embryo, in Our Lady. The salvation, the union between heaven and earth, as the theologians call it, theosis. God became man so that men might become like God. It's happening here, and it changes everything. You notice in the picture that the veil is being drawn back. Nothing is without interest in this kind of art. Everything has meaning. Everything is a symbol of a mystery. The moving of the veil in Latin is revelatio, or if we translate it, revelation. Revelation is God revealing himself to us. The veil is being pulled back, and our Lord is not just revealing information or a prophecy or even the Ten Commandments. He's revealing himself, his very face, his very person in the Word made flesh. This is the greatest of all revelations. Notice the image 
to the top left of the picture, to Mary's right in the framing the picture, on the far side, you see a desert land, and you see an angel, almost a reverse of the angel Gabriel, looks so beautiful from heaven with joy, whilst this angel is robed in black because there is a death of mortal sin, of the original sin. He's casting Adam and Eve out of the paradise in which they were created. You notice how they're weeping in the image. Frangelico is putting this here because it's precisely Our Lady in her fiat, in her yes, who is reversing the original sin. Frangelico knew from the early fathers of the church that Our Lady is called a second Eve, a new Eve. This is teaching that goes right back to the earliest times. She reverses the first disobedience of Eve by her obedience, by her fidelity, by her yes. She is the new Eve. St. Paul says that Christ is the new Adam. He is already there in her womb. So they are reversing. They are reversing the curse of the fall, of the original sin. And then notice the great contrast between the, the barrenness of that desert of original sin and the beauty, the fruitfulness of the garden of the incarnation. For Angelico, for what, one of the first people in art to do this, he paints beautifully the flowers of nature in that garden. It's like they are flowering anew because Christ has arrived. Reminds us of that passage from Scripture, from the Song of Songs. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come, because the winter is now over, and the flowers have appeared in our land. C.S. Lewis, the Christian author, picked up on this theme in writing his famous Narnia stories. Some of you may like, as I do, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, because it's filled with allegory, a little bit like this picture of Fra Angelico, and the allegory of the Narnia story of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is that when Aslan, who is a lion in the story, appears in Narnia, the curse of an everlasting winter brought about by the fall of men is beginning to be reversed and when Aslan comes, when Aslan arrives, spring begins to appear. That's how they know that Aslan is on the move. Well, C.S. Lewis didn't invent this, it's scriptural, but it's also in Frangelico's images that where Christ is, there is a new fruitfulness, not only of the soul, but of nature as well. And I think Frangelico realized this with his art, that when we have our Lord, when we have the beautiful one, the Stella Matutina, the morning star, as St. Bede, the patron of this church, once wrote. You have the sublime beauty, and beauty follows. The beauty of, in culture, particularly in our architecture, in our art, in our music, beauty flows forth from Christ. And if there is an ugliness and a brutality to our modern world and its expressions, it's because they are not focusing on the Stella Matutina, on the beauty of Christ. There is a beauty, too, of the floor in this image. Have you noticed how the floor is like a multicolored marble? It reminds us that when we are in the state of grace, every step that we make is filled with the stuff of heaven. The glory of heaven comes into our world through the state of grace in our souls. And so it's not just a matter of being in God's favor or out of God's favor, whether in mortal sin or not. It's about whether we're living life fully as we're meant to, shining with the glory of the sons and daughters of God. Our Lady shows us that footprint of grace throughout her life, and it began with her conception, but it shines forth so beautifully in this mystery of the Annunciation. There's so much more that can be said about this mystery, but I'll leave you with one final reflection, that this image of Fra Angelico of the Annunciation is an altarpiece. 
You have mass in front of it, as in the traditional posture of the Christian ages. When our Lord becomes present on the corporal of the altar at Mass, it is akin, analogous to, how he became present in the womb of Our Lady. You can't see Jesus, our Lord, in this picture of Fra Angelica in the Annunciation. He's hidden. You can't see Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, in his humanity. You have to recognize him under the veil of the appearance of bread, just as we have to recognize him in the, under the appearance of Our Lady in this image. Also, in every Mass, he becomes truly and really present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, in a miraculous way, just as he became present by means of a miracle in the womb of our Blessed Lady. And in the Incarnation, too, he is offering his very life for us. He comes that we may be saved. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. And as we were saying earlier in the meditation on the sorrows of Our Lady, her yes is also her offering of her Son for our salvation. I'll leave you with a very beautiful prayer. O oh, Jesus, living in Mary, come to live in your servants, in the spirit of holiness, in the fullness of your power, in the perfection of your ways, in the truth of your virtues, in the communion of your mysteries. Rule over every adverse power in your spirit for the glory of the Father. Amen. Amen. Ave Maria. Amen.